Uh, NASA, we are ready. Okay, we'll start. Dear friends, good day, good evening, and good night. And even good morning to all those who are sitting in a cozy chair at their monitors with a cup of tea or coffee and who hears and sees us thanks to internet. We are in one of the halls of the biggest news agency in Russia. It's a very special hall. It's equipped with the most modern equipment that allows us to have straight connection with NASA USA where we see our guest Nobel Prize winner Dr. John Mother. Good morning, John. We're very glad to see you in good health, good condition. From this hall, we'll broadcast your lecture in internet and thousands of people will see you in different places of our big country. But before we start the lecture, I would like to say several words. Well, first of all, this is a celebration of uh, intellectual communication. It happened thanks to two organizations, Dynasty Foundation and the news agency RIA Novosti. I would like to remind all our listeners that Dynasty Foundation, John, it will be interesting for you, is the first private charity foundation in Russia. It was organized on his own money by Dmitry Zimin. He is very famous in Russia because he was the founder of uh, Cell Communication in Russia, company Vimpelcon. The aims of uh, foundation is to find and support young talents in science and education because uh, Dmitry thinks that talented people can change our life to better. I hope you agree. Dynasty Foundation has a vast program of polarization, popularization of science. In the framework of this program, there is a project, Science Without Borders. And we invite people who read public lectures. We had the Nobel Prize winner James Watson, Prize winner David Gross, well-known physicist Freeman Dyson and others. Today we came to listen to you. Unfortunately, we cannot uh, feel you alive, I would say, but we can hear and uh, see you, thanks to Internet. I hope everything works as it should, but if there are any problems, please uh, forgive us, it's our first experience. And a couple of words about the second organizer. Of course, it's the Russian news agency RIA Novosti. Uh, this year, the news agency also organized its own program uh, for popularization of uh, science. And the multimedia project, the Mosaics of Knowledge, was launched this year. They also invite to lecture different scientists, different age, different profession. All those uh, who share the ideas of permanent self-education and those who are ready to share their own experience and knowledge. I would also like to say, to introduce to you, John, people who are present at this hall. There is a support group of you, reporters, journalists from different news agencies, 
the staff of the foundation and agency. So director of Dynasty Foundation, Anna Piotrowska. Here she is. She is the director of the foundation and also project director. You know him by correspondence, Konstantin Petrov. He is somewhere here. Now you know how he looks like. I also would like to introduce Albina Julaeva, the producer of this project, Mosaics of New of Science in Ria Novosti. So the most important words well already said. And now I give the word to Nobel Prize winner in physics, John Mother. And we'll be hearing a lecture from the Big Bang to the Nobel Prize and the new Nobel Prizes. And after the lecture, we'll have an opportunity to ask him some questions. The questions will be online, the questions will be from the hall, and also we'll receive the questions via internet. Are you ready, John? Good luck. So, uh, greetings from, uh, from NASA Goddard Space Flight Center here in Maryland in the United States. This is the uh, largest uh, scientific laboratory for NASA, uh, and this is where I have been working for a long time. Uh, since 1976, and uh, now I want to tell you the story of the work that I have been doing for much of this time and, uh, and the work of many others. <clears throat> so I want to tell you about the history of the universe. Uh, so uh, do you actually see on your screen my, uh, my uh, view graphs, my uh, computer uh, presentation? Yes, we see, we see, yeah. Okay, very good. S so... Um, I will try the next slide, see if that turns up correctly. Good. <clears throat> I wanted to uh, show you uh, where I started out my scientific career as a child. Uh, this is the spot in uh, New Jersey, uh, which is a, an experimental farm for the U University of New Rutgers University in New Jersey. Uh, it is a uh, place where my father was studying uh, dairy cows. Uh, the uh, production and improvement of milk uh, from dairy cows, and uh, it was also a good place for a young person such as myself to uh, to read many books and to look at the sky at night. So one never knows uh, what history will uh, produce. So uh, now I want to tell you what astronomers are busy doing. Uh, we have, uh, as astronomers, the task of understanding the entire history of the universe and how it produces the possibility for life here on the Earth. So uh, astronomers uh, start with a picture of the Big Bang, uh, as seen from the inside, and I will tell you more about how we measured this. Uh, we have ideas about how the first galaxies and stars were made and how they change with time. Uh, we have ideas about how uh, star, stars enable planets to exist, and finally, how uh, they enable the possibility for life to occur, uh, as you see there in the middle of the screen, uh, very uh, many uh, possibilities exist. Uh, so astronomers have the easy part. We have to explain the physical part. Uh, eventually, the biologists have to explain the uh, biological part, which is much more difficult. Now, I would like to give you a bit of a surprise here. Uh, when uh, one wakes up in the morning to uh, comb one's hair or to uh, prepare to go out for the day, uh, you are already looking at evidence about the beginning of the universe. Uh, because when you look at yourself, you are looking at atoms that uh, did not exist in the Big Bang material, but were produced later uh, by generations of stars which exploded and, and liberated their uh, material back out into outer space and it's come back to be reformed and uh, recycled into uh, stars and planets, and we therefore are able to live on the planet Earth because uh, previous uh, stars have exploded and been recycled. So uh, it's a strange and exotic story that we have to tell, uh, but uh, any story that would explain the whole history of the universe would indeed be strange and exotic. 
Now, the next chart, I will explain a little bit uh, for the general public about how astronomers are able to tell this story. So the first and perhaps most important thing is that astronomers are able to look directly back in time. Uh, light travels extremely rapidly, uh, but uh, speed is nevertheless not infinity. So we are able to look back in time, uh, small amounts or large amounts, according to how far away we are looking. So if you see... Uh, the sun, you see it as it was uh, 500 seconds ago, uh, the nearest other star as it was about four years ago, or if you were able to look at the most distant things in the universe, you see them as they were about uh, 15,000 million years ago. Uh, the current best number is 13.7 thousand million years ago. So we are able to look back in time uh, unlike all other scientists. Now, um, Geologists do indeed look back at old rocks, and historians look at old documents, but astronomers look at things as they actually were thousands or to billions of years ago. Uh, our penalty, our challenge is that the images that we get are fuzzy and faint and require a lot of calculation and thought, but nevertheless, we do indeed see things as they were when light was sent out billions of years ago. So the next uh, question that uh, the public would have is, well, how far do you, how f how far back are you looking in time? So uh, we have, of course, just to measure distances. So um, we measure distances in the same way that the ancient Greek astronomers and ancient Egyptian astronomers could do. Uh, we use uh, trigonometry. Uh, if you know uh, one. Uh, side of a triangle and you know two of the angles, you can calculate the entire shape of the triangle. So uh, this is basically surveying, as has been done for thousands of years. Uh, the other technique is to use uh, standard candles. If a uh, star is believed to be exactly like another star, but appears fainter, then we say it is farther away, uh, according to what we call the inverse square law for brightness of stars. So the combination of measuring distances and knowing the speed of light uh, enables us to not only measure the size of the universe, but also its age. So uh, the other thing we would like to know is how fast are things moving? Uh, very few things move uh, rapidly enough across the sky that we can recognize the motion. Uh, but a uh, few things uh, uh, are enough. Now, um, the other thing that's actually more uh, straightforward to measure is the rate of motion towards us or away from us. So this uh, chart uh, shows the uh, Doppler shift. Uh, the Doppler shift has been known since the 19th century uh, and it was first observed with sound waves. Uh, for astronomy, uh, we uh, use spectroscopy. We spread out the light from a distant star uh, with a prism or a grating uh, spectrometer. And when we do this for the sun, we see that there are dark lines across the sky, uh, across the spectrum, which are due to particular atoms and molecules in the atmosphere of the sun. Uh, when we do the same thing with distant stars and distant galaxies, we see the same pattern of lines uh, or similar, uh, but the wavelengths are often quite different. And we attribute this to the relative motion of those objects uh, compared to ourselves. So we see uh, the most distant objects in the universe are actually going away from us quite fast. Uh, and we measure their velocities by the change of wavelength that we recognize in these uh, spectra. So in 1929, Edwin Hubble made this chart uh, and uh, discovered basically that the universe appears to be expanding. Now, the little dots and circles on this chart represent uh, individual galaxies. He was the first person to be able to measure the distance to other galaxies uh, by studying the standard candles that he saw in them. Uh, there are pulsating stars that we recognize as standard candles, and so we can use the relative brightness to estimate distance. And he was also able to measure the speed, uh, uh, sorry, uh, from, the, uh, from the Doppler shift. So this is the chart that he made, and what we see is that uh, almost all of the galaxies are going away from us very rapidly at hundreds to thousands of kilometers per second. And if you divide the apparent speed by the, into the distance, you can estimate the time that it has taken to achieve all of these positions. So it appears that all of the distant galaxies are receding from us uh, at, a, at a speed proportional to distance, divide distance by speed, and obtain the age of the universe. So uh, in 1929, when he discovered this, 
it was a very, very important discovery. It was an almost complete surprise for everyone in the entire world, and it was uh, news headline news around the world that year. A much better news than the news of the economic collapse that occurred at the same year. So on this next chart, I have illustrated some of the most famous scientists that worked on this subject. Um, in the uh, center, you see Albert Einstein, a very familiar kind of picture. Uh, in 1916, he gave us the general theory of relativity which explains that the uh, effect of gravity is to curve uh, space-time. And so this was a, a very surprising and puzzling prediction for him, but his uh, uh, calculations were quite quickly verified uh, by measurements. Uh, in 1922, the uh, young man Alexander Friedman, that I sh have shown here on the left side of the picture, was working in Leningrad, uh, and he said, okay, I understand Einstein's equations. I predict that the universe was uh, expanding uh, from an initial condition. Uh, and Einstein said that could not possibly be right. Uh, in 1927, Georges Lemaitre, who is shown in the center there with Einstein, uh, repeated the calculation, got the same answer, and again Einstein said that could not possibly be correct. So two years after that, uh, Edwin Hubble published the chart that I just showed you, and of course Einstein had to apologize for his, uh, his uh, rude behavior and his failure to uh, understand the nature of the universe. I've shown also some uh, more modern uh, scientists here. Uh, George Gamow is shown in the upper right corner. Uh, he came from Odessa to the United States, and in uh, 1948, uh, he was working with uh, two young men, uh, Robert Herman and Ralph Alpher, uh, who are shown in the lower left corner. Uh, they were calculating the story of the Big Bang, and they actually predicted that the universe should be filled with the heat of the Big Bang radiation. So this is very bright radiation uh, in uh, relative terms, approximately one microwatt per square meter, uh, and they predicted it correctly in 1948. It was not possible at that time to measure it uh, because techniques were still very primitive. Um, now in the uh, lower right corner, I have two very modern scientists, uh, Rashid Sunyaev and Jim Peebles, who have been uh, making calculations for many years, uh, telling us what we should see uh, when we uh, actually go measure the sky, and they have been uh, pioneers in, in theoretical calculation. So now I, in my next chart, I want to explain that although everyone pictures the universe expanding from a point, um, it is not the way that it seems to be to us. Uh, what we seem to see is that there is no center of the universe, uh, there is no edge, uh, and all of the astronomers that calculate uh, Hubble's law from observations like these uh, would uh, all believe that they were in the center of the universe. So since they all believe that they are in the center, um, there cannot be a center. So, uh, so far, uh, we cannot see that there is a center. It's not completely impossible, uh, but no observations have shown any sign of a center or an edge of the universe. So. This is a very uh, surprising com result from the uh, theoretical calculations, uh, but uh, that also means that it's impossible for us to draw a picture. Um, all I can do is show you a red color to signify that we cannot draw a picture. So um, <clears throat> we uh, human beings live in uh, uh, three dimensions of space and one of time, but uh, to be able to look at the universe from outside the universe would require a higher number of dimensions, which we can only imagine and cannot draw. So I'm sorry, we cannot draw you a good picture, and we cannot see the center or the edge if there is one. So here I would like to summarize the history of the early universe. So if we imagine that the primordial material, whatever it may have been, uh, may have actually extended in infinitely far in every dimension. And there may have been uh, more than the four dimensions that we know about. So some small portion of this material did something strange and began to expand. Uh, and expanded so fast that even light could not keep up with the expansion. So the uh, small volume that I've just described, 10 centimeters in size, uh, we imagine uh, uh, accelerates very rapidly and becomes the entire expanding universe that we are now able to observe.
an extremely implausible story, uh, but nevertheless the one that seems best at the moment. <coughs> <clears throat> so you could also ask, how did the entire universe fit into that small volume that I've just mentioned? And uh, there are many parts to this. <clears throat> One is that uh, space itself <clears throat> space itself is extremely empty. The stars are very, very far apart from one another. <clears throat> Even atoms are almost completely empty. The atomic nuclei are very tiny compared to the size of a whole atom. Uh, and if you could uh, reach inside the atomic nuclei, um, you can actually tear them apart and find that they are made out of even smaller particles called quarks and gluons. So the, uh, be, the uh, calculation says that it's actually not so impossible as you might think for the entire uh, present day universe to be produced from this very small volume of primordial material. This is the story of what was called inflation and has been uh, uh, known since the mid middle of the 1980s. <clears throat> so now the next question is that you would want to know is, uh, how is it possible that we can exist? Uh, since the universe is expanding, uh, we do not see ourselves expanding. How can we exist? So the, uh, the uh, short version of the answer is that gravitation, which reaches across the universe is actually able to stop the expansion for regions of the universe that are slightly more dense than average. So uh, it means that uh, uh, some parts that uh, were initially created uh, in the Big Bang material that are more dense, they will stop expanding, they will turn into galaxies and clusters of galaxies and then stars and there, therefore it's possible for uh, the sun to exist and for the earth to exist and for all of the complex life here on earth to exist it's all be depends on the fact that gravitation is able to stop the expansion of th certain parts of the universe so here we are so on this chart I have a, uh, a short version of the history of the universe you will, should see uh, a picture of the Big Bang um, as measured by the Cosmic Background Explorer and the WMAP Observatory. Uh, and uh, we imagine that uh, galaxies were formed from small parts that flow together as uh, small streams flow together to form giant rivers. Uh, and then in the lower left corner, I have a picture of our nearest galaxy, the nearest large galaxy. It's called the Andromeda Nebula. Uh, and you can see that it's uh, very beautiful and has even two small satellite galaxies orbiting around it. So I'll uh, skip some of the history of the universe here. I just mention a few major events. Uh, when the universe was about three minutes old, uh, the atomic uh, nuclei of helium were formed from protons and neutrons. When the universe was about 389,000 years old, uh, the electrons found the atomic nuclei and the gaseous material became transparent uh, instead of being a hot plasma. So uh, when the universe became transparent, then the primordial heat radiation, uh, which could travel uh, only a very short distance before that, uh, afterwards it was able to tra travel all the way across the universe. So we are now uh, sitting here on Earth. We're able to measure and observe the primordial heat radiation as it was when the universe became transparent 389,000 years old. So. Uh, after that, then the first stars formed. Uh, we've never seen this occur. Uh, we calculate there must be something. Then galaxies were formed. And then uh, a great surprise occurs. About five billion years ago, the uh, universe be began to accelerate again. And so it's going faster and faster uh, every year. A tremendous surprise. So now I'd like to illustrate uh, some of the events that probably happened to the Earth. Uh, the Sun and the first solid bodies in the solar system uh, were formed uh, 4.567 billion years ago, uh, only about one-third the age of the universe. Um, and so we have this very precisely measured from radioisotopes and the tiny particles that we have retrieved uh, from uh, meteorites. So about 90 million years later, a small planet, uh, probably uh, about the size of Mars, uh, which we have uh, given the name of Thea, uh, it is said to have hit the Earth, and it would have melted everything on the Earth, 
and uh, materials like carbon and hydrogen would have uh, gone back out into space. The rocky debris was left and it formed the Earth and the Moon um, about 90 million years after the formation of the solar system. So then, uh, following that, uh, the Earth began to cool. Uh, then, uh, about uh, several hundred million years later, Jupiter and Saturn are thought to have switched their orbits twice. Uh, and so during that period of time, the Earth was bombarded uh, with uh, very many uh, meteorites and comets and uh, water and carbon probably came to Earth during that period of time. Uh, then uh, at the end of that, uh, life is supposed to have formed. There is fossil evidence that life could have formed uh, as soon as the, uh, the conditions became uh, uh, suitable here on Earth, that the temperature was low enough and there was enough water for this to occur. Um, another interesting point is that the early sun was probably much more active and had many, many sunspots on it uh, and has been getting brighter with time, uh, getting, making the Earth get warmer and warmer. So um, it's possible even that the Earth was completely frozen solid uh, for some portions of its early life. So as you know, uh, no doubt also, the continents on the Earth have been moving uh, over the course of time. Uh, they've been uh, causing uh, tremendous changes of the atmospheric composition. Uh, sometimes it appears that the atmosphere was poisonous, uh, full of carbon dioxide and hydrogen sulfide. Uh, at other times, these molecules went back into the rocks uh, through a biological and chemical activity of many kinds. So there are these many continents that uh, scientists and geologists have uh, recreated in uh, maps. Um, and uh, very recently, only 100 million years ago, the Atlantic Ocean opened up, separating uh, the Americas from Europe and Asia and, and uh, Africa. Very recently, um, the human beings uh, came to live in Africa. Uh, it is thought that the uh, origin of the human race is in Africa about 150,000 years ago, very recent. Uh, during a, an ice age uh, where uh, much of the world was dry and uh, much of the world was covered by ice. Uh, so um, mm -hmm. I don't have time to tell you all of the stories about this. I uh, would just like, however, to point out that this is also the 400th year of mm -hmm. telescopic astronomy. Uh, Galileo pointed a small telescope at the sky, and we have been celebrating around the world uh, with the International Year of Astronomy. I have some bad news for the future, and it's possible that all of the carbon dioxide will be used up by uh, biological activity and it will all become limestone. And at that point, uh, the Earth will become very cold because we will be completely out of, uh, we will have no greenhouse gases left. That's a possibility. It may not come to happen. We cannot predict the geological future very well. About a billion years into the future, uh, the sun will become so bright then that it will become too hot for us here, regardless of what we may do uh, as, uh, as living beings. Uh, then in about five billion years, the sun will actually swell and become so large that the Earth orbits within the surface of the sun, and uh, at that time, um, the Earth may be destroyed. At about that same time, the uh, beautiful Andromeda Nebula that I showed you a few minutes ago will collide with the Milky Way, and it will be a spectacular time to be an astronomer, but we will have to move to some other planet. Uh, not that we know how to do that, but uh, some future astronomer on some other planet will have a good time. In about 7.6 billion years, the sun will be extinguished and uh, will become a white dwarf star. Uh, many billions of years after that, we anticipate that the universe will continue to accelerate, the distant galaxies will go away, all the stars will, will burn out, and it will become dark. Um, but this is only a theoretical prediction, uh, and there are many other possibilities, including the possibility that the acceleration will stop and the galaxies will all fall back together and there will be a cosmic collapse. Uh, we don't know, of course. Now I would like to tell you a little bit of the story of my personal work that led to the Nobel Prize. Uh, in 1974, uh, I finished my graduate school at Berkeley, California, uh, after an attempt to measure the cosmic heat radiation from the Big Bang. Uh, it was not a successful attempt, but it showed us what we needed to do to do a better job. 
And we all knew that a better measurement could be done with a space mission. So in 1976, uh, when I uh, came to Goddard Space Flight Center, we began to design this observatory um, called the Cosmic Background Explorer. And what you see here uh, in the picture is a, uh, a sun shield, this uh, yellowish uh, gold colored, colored cone. Uh, inside the cone are the instruments. Uh, there is a, uh, a collection of instruments. Uh, two of them are inside a helium tank uh, at a, operating at a temperature of 1.5 degrees above absolute zero. And the others are surrounding the tank, and they're just protected from the Earth and the sun so that they can become cold. So this observatory is still in orbit around the Earth, uh, but it was only used for about five years uh, to, uh, to make the initial observations. So it's called the Cosmic Background Explorer, and one can actually see it in the evening if you know when to look. Now, this is the uh, chart that uh, shows the first scientific result of this mission. Um, what we show here is a prediction of the uh, spectrum of the cosmic microwave heat radiation. Uh, the smooth curve is the prediction, and the first measurements that we reported are the um, little boxes on the curve. Uh, you will see that all the little boxes uh, are exactly on the curve, uh, which is exactly what I expected, but it was not a known fact. Uh, when we showed this uh, measurement to the Astronomical Society, we received a standing ovation and many minutes of, uh, of applause. So um, what it means is that the Big Bang theory is actually as close to proven as possible. There's no real proof of a thing so dramatic as the Big Bang theory, but all of the measurements um, now agree with it, and this is one of the most important parts of the evidence. So we now really do believe that the universe came from the Big Bang and produced this heat radiation, which is measured here. Now, uh, after many years of effort, we now know that the temperature is exactly 2.725 Kelvin and that those error bars are very, very, very tiny, only 50 parts per million. So uh, this is the first major result of the, of the observatory. Uh, two years later, in 1992, uh, we showed this uh, set of charts, uh, and when Stephen Hawking, a uh, very famous uh, physicist, saw this chart, he said, this was the most important scientific discovery of the century, if not of all time. So what we have here is a map of the temperature of this heat radiation from the Big Bang. Um, the, each of the ovals there that you see is a map of the entire sky. So the first map, the top one, uh, shows the raw data as they come in. Um, and you see that all we can see is that one side of the sky is a little pink and the other side is a little um, greenish. And we uh, say, well, that is due to the fact that the Earth is moving relative to the rest of the universe. When we remove that effect mathematically, we see the picture in the middle. Uh, and what we now see is a red band across the middle, which is due to the uh, electron population in our own Milky Way galaxy. When we remove that one as well by doing some more mathematics, we see the picture at the bottom, uh, which is a map of the temperature uh, variations across the sky of this uh, primordial heat radiation. And so the differences are very small, uh, approximately 30 micro degrees Kelvin. Uh, so um, on the other hand, we believe that this, these uh, temperature variations are responsible for our own existence. Uh, they are produced by dark matter, which is a new uh, new discovery from astronomers, and they are uh, responsible for the uh, dense vari density uh, variations that enable some regions of the universe to stop expanding and to turn around and become galaxies, stars, and planets. So something like one of these small blobs is the, responsible for our own existence. Now, we can't see the one that's our own history, but we imagine that ours was like this. So three years ago uh, this month, I received a telephone call from Stockholm saying uh, that uh, we were going to receive the Nobel Prize. And so it's for the discovery of the black body form. And that's the uh, theoretical curve that I showed you uh, with the little boxes on it. Um, and the anisotropy, which is a Greek word, and it means uh, not the same in every direction. So those are the small lumps uh, and bumps that are seen on the, in the uh, colored map. So 
Um, then I went to see the King of Sweden, uh, received my diploma, uh, received a nice uh, uh, check, have started a foundation for uh, the promotion of science and the arts, uh, mostly for scholarships for young people. So now, however, I would like to say that there are some surprises still open for astronomers. Uh, this cartoon says that uh, we uh, frequently obtain a surprise, uh, that the universe is not the way that astronomers have said that it is. Uh, and so I uh, will illustrate uh, one of those surprises here. Uh, in uh, 1998 here is a picture from the cover of Science Magazine. Uh, because it was discovered in that year that the universe is accelerating, going faster and faster each year. Uh, and it was discovered uh, especially by these three men in the right-hand picture. Um, they studied uh, distant stars uh, called supernovae, and they found out that the most distant ones they could see were 20% too faint. The uh, result of that is that we believe that the universe has been accelerating in the last 5 billion years. Uh, and due to some uh, force which we call dark energy, uh, but in fact we do not know anything about this uh, thing that we call dark energy, and it's not even really a force. So it's pretty clear that uh, this is a potential uh, Nobel Prize winning discovery. Uh, uh, who knows uh, when we will, may actually know what this substance, if it is a substance, actually is. But it's one of the most important topics of, cur of current investigation in astronomy. So astronomers have a few mysteries open, um, which we uh, share with physicists. Uh, number one, why is there only ordinary matter? And there is no antimatter anywhere in the universe except uh, very temporary uh, antimatter particles. Uh, there are no anti-galaxies that we can tell. Uh, the second question is, what is the dark matter? Uh, I told you there is dark matter and that it's responsible for uh, the uh, small uh, temperature variations in the microwave radiation. Uh, this dark matter uh, is apparently much more abundant than the matter that we're made out of, uh, but it uh, does not produce or interact with light waves. So we cannot see it directly. Uh, we do detect that it has gravitational force. Uh, so we're very sure that it exists, but uh, no particle of dark matter has ever been seen in a laboratory. Uh, what is the dark energy? I just told you that we have dark energy, uh, but we don't know what it is. Now, every student uh, from uh, elementary school to, uh, to uh, graduate school and on always says, well, are you really sure that Einstein was right about uh, relativity? Uh, are you sure that we can't go faster than the speed of light? Uh, and of course, uh, it's still a good question. Uh, astronomers are busy trying to answer the question of how did we arrive here on Earth? How is it possible that uh, the Earth has uh, come to exist? And of course, a uh, more uh, philosophical question is, um, are we the only human beings in the universe? Are, are we the only uh, intelligent creatures in the universe? Part of that question is, uh, how is it possible for the Earth to become a place where we can live and another part is, uh, is there any other place in the universe that could support life? Uh, so, um, and of course, in the, another question is, what is going to happen to us in the future? Which leads me to the next project that I'm now working on, um, called the James Webb Space Telescope. So uh, to explain why we want the James Webb Space Telescope, let me explain about infrared light. Uh, infrared light is like ordinary light uh, that you see with your eyes, but it has a somewhat longer wavelengths, so, and it comes from somewhat cooler objects. So um, uh, it's important to us for a number of astronomical reasons. Um, number one, uh, if we want to look at the most distant universe, the light of the first galaxies that we would like to understand uh, has uh, starts out as ultraviolet light, but when it arrives at us, uh, has been redshifted uh, by the expansion of the universe, so it is infrared light. So to learn our history, to look back far in time, we need to use infrared telescopes. The other thing that is important to us is that, uh, as you see here, um, <clears throat> objects at room temperature, like ourselves, uh, emit infrared radiation, uh, and it's quite different in character from, um, from the visible light that we would see. So if we want to study as astronomers what uh, 
objects are like that are near room temperature, we should study uh, infrared radiation that comes from such objects. So that leads us to the uh, concept for this new telescope. This is the, called the James Webb Space Telescope, and it is planned as the next great telescope after the Hubble Space Telescope. So um, it's been in preparations uh, now for uh, 14 years, and uh, it's going to be launched in 2014, according to our plan. Uh, this is a, a very different telescope from any that you have ever seen in uh, outer space or on the ground uh, because it's uh, made out of uh, segments. It uh, unfolds after it is launched into space, and it's extremely cold. Uh, so I'm going to show you how this is done in a moment, uh, but just to uh, tell you who is building it, um, NASA is the lead organization for this project, uh, and uh, it's being led here from Goddard Space Flight Center, where I'm speaking. Uh, we are working this as an international partnership with the European and Sp Canadian space agencies, and we have uh, contracted with the Northrop Grumman, uh, which is a large aerospace firm uh, located near Los Angeles Airport, uh, to build the observatory. There are instruments that cover in all the infrared wavelengths that we want to study, uh, and they come from uh, Arizona and the United States, uh, from the European Space Agency, and from Canada. So um, I should also say that this telescope is much larger than any telescope we've ever had in space. Uh, the uh, Hubble Space Telescope has a mirror that's 2.4 meters in diameter. Uh, the one that we are flying now has a diameter of 6.5 meters, so it's much, much, much larger and will collect much more light from the distant universe. And it's also uh, arranged so it's very cold. I'm going to show you the orbit that we put it in, uh, but what you see in the picture here is a, a, a large, uh, what you see here is blue, uh, it's actually a giant umbrella. It is made of five layers of plastic. And the uh, plastic layers protect the telescope from the heat of the sun and the earth. So the telescope will be capable of achieving a very low temperature of approximately 40 degrees Kelvin so that it uh, does not emit infrared light itself. So here is the orbit that we will use uh, for the telescope. Uh, it orbits uh, around a uh, place called the Sun-Earth-Lagrange point, L2. Uh, L2 is about 1 million miles, 1.5 million kilometers away from Earth. And we put the telescope out there so that the uh, umbrella or sun shield can protect the telescope from the heat of the sun and the Earth at the same time. So these points have been known uh, since the 18th century, um, discovered by mathematicians. Now, the, um, model, this uh, illustrates a couple of places where the um, model of the telescope has been. Uh, we had the uh, model built to sort of show the world how big is the telescope and how powerful it may be. So uh, it's been traveling around the world. Uh, it's been to uh, uh, many cities. Uh, here it's shown as it was in uh, Munich, Germany, uh, a year ago, and as it was in Washington uh, the year before that. So you see that it's very large. Now here, I hope that you will be able to see the movie uh, showing how the telescope unfolds after it is launched. Uh, this uh, telescope is much larger than the rocket, and so um, it has to be unfolded after it is launched. And uh, at first, uh, the uh, telescope uh, um, solar power uh, cells come out, and then the telemetry antenna for the radio waves uh, and then uh, the plastic shield uh, comes out. Uh, this is all done by remote control. Um, motors uh, and actuators uh, cause this to happen uh, while we sit here on Earth um, making sure that it's all working correctly. So the last thing for it to happen, for it to do, is for it to adjust the telescope to the right shape. Uh, you will see in a moment that the uh, mirrors uh, come to uh, form the giant hexagon that uh, is the primary mirror. So there is the telescope as it will be uh, used in flight. Um, a truly a tremendous challenge for engineering 
but uh, obviously one that we must solve to make this observatory work in, in space. So we had many inventions to make uh, to uh, show that this observatory would work. Um, probably the most important one for us was the uh, what we call mirror phasing algorithms. Uh, when the Hubble Space Telescope was launched, uh, it did not work correctly. Uh, there was an error in the mirror. So uh, it was necessary to learn how to measure the f error of the mirror and to uh, calculate how to make a repair. So the mathematics was developed for the Hubble Space Telescope repair. And now, uh, because we know how to do that, we can use the same mathematics to adjust all 18 pieces of the mirror to the correct shape and position so that they function as a single giant reflecting mirror. So uh, now um, I just wanted to illustrate that we have to practice this adjustment uh, with a small telescope. Uh, this is a, uh, um, a model that uh, can be adjusted in exactly the same way as the telescope in space. So uh, we've learned how to do this and demonstrated that it does work. I would like to uh, show you just for a moment the engineering drawings of the instrument packages. Uh, I can't really uh, explain these to you. Uh, I just wanted to say that they're coming along very well. Uh, and uh, Europe is contributing the near-infrared spectrograph in the upper right side there and the mid-infrared instrument on the lower right uh, picture. So uh, all of these are coming along beautifully, and uh, they will be begin to arrive at Goddard Space Flight Center next year. Uh, one thing I wanted to show also was that uh, we will test the telescope. Uh, this is the giant test chamber which the um, astronauts used uh, when they were getting ready to make their trip to the moon. They rehearsed uh, their operations inside this test chamber. Uh, we are now preparing this test chamber to cool down uh, to the very low temperature that's necessary so we can test our telescope inside as well. Now I'd like to talk a little bit about the uh, astronomy that people hope to do with this observatory. Um, uh, this picture was taken quite recently with the Hubble Space Telescope uh, and the uh, startling thing that I want to point out to you is there's a, a curve, uh, a curved image in the upper right corner um, which turns out to be um, caused by the gravitational force of the uh, galaxies that you see in this picture. Uh, the curved pink curve there is actually the image of a much more distant galaxy uh, that has been distorted by the gravitational field of these galaxies that you do see. So uh, nature has provided us an additional lens out there in space to bend and concentrate the light of even more distant galaxies uh, and if we can find these places, we can see much, much farther than we ever could see with, uh, without uh, knowing about them. So uh, we anticipate that the James Webb Telescope will do the same, uh, but even better. So the next picture here shows that uh, we have found a number of galaxies uh, that uh, appear to be held together by dark matter. These are galaxies uh, photographed by the Hubble Space Telescope. They're all very nearby, uh, and they're very small. Uh, but we calculate how massive they must be, and we uh, calculate that that mass could only exist in the form of dark matter um, that's necessary to hold these small galaxies together. So um, it's clearly one of the great intellectual challenges of our age to find out what is the dark matter and the dark energy that fill our universe and cannot be seen in our laboratories. Uh, now, the Hubble telescope has given us these beautiful pictures of galaxies interacting with each other. Um, these galaxies are, as they are, relatively close to us in uh, relatively recent times. Uh, we think that our own Milky Way galaxy may have done this as well, uh, and may have collided with other neighboring galaxies uh, in its history. And of course, I told you we think that it will happen to us in about five billion years when the Andromeda Nebula comes towards us and collides with us. So it will be a spectacular event. Now, I think you may even be able to see a computer-generated movie of a collision of two galaxies. 
Um, I hope this is working for you. Uh, for just a moment, the computer-generated movie looks like the picture in the upper center of the uh, chart here. Uh, and then you see what will happen to the, the galaxies as they, uh, as they uh, have complete their collision. So this is a uh, possibility for our own galaxy as it collides with the Milky Way. Uh, we would love to know how stars and planets form. Uh, astronomers have been drawing pictures like this one for uh, many, many years, uh, but it's still pretty much a theoretical prediction. Uh, it's very hard to observe this uh, process forming uh, because stars happen to form inside dusty regions of the sky where we cannot see them. Uh, here is one of the most famous pictures taken with the Hubble Space Telescope. It's called the Eagle Nebula. Uh, and it's a place where stars have just formed. Very recently formed stars are here. And the, uh, you can see that they're burning uh, very brightly and uh, making uh, the dust clouds begin to evaporate. Uh, but we think that the stars that we now see were formed inside the dust clouds uh, many uh, hundreds of thousands, or sorry, many millions of years ago. Uh, and that uh, we would definitely like to see inside the dust cloud to see how this process works. So with infrared light, we can actually see the same region, uh, and it looks very different. So infrared light will go through the dust clouds and enable us to see stars as they were being formed uh, and uh, help us understand the process. Ideally, over the course of time, we would learn how the Earth could be formed uh, around a sun that would be formed inside one of these dust clouds. Now, very recently, it's been recognized that uh, we can even detect planets around other stars. When I was a young person, it was known that was never going to happen. It was completely impossible to imagine how this could be done. But it has been done. Uh, this is a drawing uh, based on a picture that was made with a Hubble Space Telescope, uh, and it shows that there is a ring of dust orbiting around a star called Fummelhot in the southern sky. And it was predicted that there would be a planet inside this dust cloud. Uh, and just uh, last year, uh, it was actually uh, measured. The picture in the lower right-hand corner here shows you um, the star Fummelhot as it was uh, uh, observed uh, more than once. And you see uh, two little, uh, in the inset picture, you see two images of the planet as it moves around inside the dust cloud uh, in the year 2004 and 2006. It's even now possible uh, to see these uh, pictures uh, in the other parts of this photograph uh, that are made with telescopes on the ground. So when the, when the planets are very bright uh, and uh, when we use a very ad advanced optics in the telescopes on the ground, it's possible uh, to see these little planets, or I should say these large planets, orbiting around other stars. So um, what's especially exciting very recently is shown in this movie. Uh, once in a while, a planet uh, passes between us and the star that it's orbiting around. So uh, this is showing uh, uh, what's been seen many times already, um, a, a planet blocking some of the light of its star. Uh, and a half an orbit later, of course, the planet will go behind the star, and, and the star will block the light of the planet. So you see the total amount of light is diminishing uh, while the star blacks the light of the planet. So if we can take the difference between the brightness that we see uh, when they are uh, not aligned uh, and then the uh, uh, cases where they are aligned and one is blocking the light of the other, then we can determine how much light came from the planet and we can determine some properties of the planet, uh, even some of the light from the planet excuse me, even some of the starlight uh, will pass through the atmosphere of the planet and we'll be able to learn about the atmospheric composition uh, of the planet uh, as it goes in front of its star. So uh, this has already been done uh, with telescopes in space. Um, there's a, uh, the Hubble Space Telescope has done this, uh, the Spitzer Space Telescope has done this, and then very recently the European uh, telescope called Koro has done it. So we are building up a large catalog of stars with planets that uh, can be seen in this way. So over the course of time, we have hope eventually to, to look for uh, stars that have planets like Earth. There's a mission called the Kepler project uh, just launched this year, 
which uh, in the next few years should discover uh, planets like Earth orbiting uh, stars like the Sun. So uh, it's uh, quite possible that uh, in the next few years you will hear an announcement that another Earth has been found. And uh, it'll take us a little while to determine whether such another Earth could happen, to could support life. Uh, but um, anyway, it's coming. I would like to close by saying there are a few other places that uh, one can also look for life in the solar system. I think everyone has heard that uh, Mars could have been alive and has been wet, uh, has uh, water uh, just under the surface uh, in frozen form, and it's ice now. Um, there are other places as well to look. Um, Europa is shown in this picture. Europa is a satellite of Jupiter. Uh, it has an ocean that is covered with ice, and you can see these brown streaks on the picture are uh, where uh, material has come up from below in the spaces between the ice. Uh, so this is, looks like the Arctic Ocean uh, with ice sheets on it, and so uh, certainly this is a very interesting place to go hunting for life in the solar system. We know that it cannot exist on the surface, but it could possibly exist in the, uh, in the ocean under the ice. In the very long term, uh, many decades in the future, we hope to build an observatory like this uh, that would study the uh, light from uh, planets around other stars. Um, whether or not this is the exact observatory that would be built, we don't know. Uh, but the uh, little picture in the lower right illustrates that there are certain chemicals that you would look for in the atmosphere of another planet to see if it is alive. Um, if you could find this combination of water vapor, carbon dioxide, and oxygen, or ozone, you would say this planet is very much like Earth, uh, particularly since the oxygen on the Earth comes from life, from planets, plants and algae. Uh, we would know that if we see another planet that has oxygen in its atmosphere, that it probably is alive just like the Earth. We would not know if it's got intelligent life, but we would know that it has life. So I will conclude by saying there are many places to learn more about this project. Um, and um, the James Webb Telescope has its own uh, web page. Uh, Cosmology has its own web page, the Lambda website. The uh, NobelPrize.org uh, website has uh, many lectures, uh, and you can read them there. And uh, I even have a small book, a paperback book, uh, unfortunately still only in English, I think, uh, called The Very First Light, that tells the story of the Cosmic Background Explorer satellite and, uh, and what it felt like to go to receive a Nobel Prize from the King of Sweden. So uh, I would like to conclude, and I will be very happy to have questions from you. Uh, thank you very much for your attention, and, and thank you for the questions. Thank you, John, for your beautiful lecture. I was amazed how you put so much material in one hour. You know, your um, telescope is so funny, it doesn't look like a telescope. But in any case, uh, thank you, John. Let's applaud. John, I'm afraid you don't have much time. You have a minute while I approach the, the table where I have the PC with um, the questions that are sent to you via Internet. And right now we start answering these questions. Dear friends, let's have a question from internet and then a question from uh, somebody from the audience. Okay, Michael will help me. Now a little technical detail. Which microphone do I speak into? No difference. Excellent. Okay, I press the button. I see a lot of questions. Let's see what do we have here. Let's start with a good question. Mm, it's interesting. Vladimir, I don't know what town he's from or city, and uh, it said the last. Uh, we know that the Big Bang happened 13.7 billion. 
millions ago. Does it mean that the radius of uh, the universe is uh, 13,7 uh, billion uh, light years? Uh, on the other hand, uh, we imagine that uh, there is much more universe beyond what we can see. So uh, the universe could actually have infinite size, but we would not know. Does this uh, distance change? Uh, yes, uh, as the universe gets older, uh, the uh, amount of time uh, that we can see uh, gets uh, larger. And so, yes, uh, uh, astronomers living another billion years in the future will say that the universe is 14.7 thousand million years old. Хорошо. Тогда у меня вопрос глубоко личный. Он меня страшно беспокоит. Now I have a personal question for you. We started. Uh, this um, two years ago, but I would like to get my answer. If we agree with the theory of the Big Bang, then we must agree at the moment of the Big Bang, the matter and time were created. Is it so? In, uh, in physics, we're actually not able to uh, describe the creation of uh, space and time. We only describe the process of change. Нет. So Джон, we вопрос. are unable to answer that question. Да, понятно. Но мы сейчас говорим о гипотезе, что мы полагаем, чтобы... But, as you know, uh, the universe... Uh, ex, uh, excels, uh, excels. Does it mean that the time accelerates too, along with the uh, distance? Uh, no, what we see is only that the distance is accelerating. So uh, we measure time with the same kinds of clocks uh, that we always use. То есть время не ускоряется. So uh, time doesn't expand, but we <laughs> feel otherwise. John, do you feel that time becomes quicker? <laughs> time seems to go quicker and quicker every day, but um, the clock says no. Хорошо. <laughs> okay, here's another question from internet. Alexandra, reporter, is it really that uh, 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 it uh, has an oval form, but uh, the Big Bang uh, should uh, shoot uh, matter into all uh, sides, and it should be a sphere and not an oval. What could you say to this? that I showed is a uh, just a map, um, just as we uh, show the surface of the Earth as an oval. Uh, those ovals are also just the representation of the entire sphere. So um, I can't, I don't have a spherical a movie screen for you. So. Uh, okay, so universe is a sphere. Yes, okay, I understand. Uh, one more question. I have an, an uh, astronomer asks, how much does the cobe, uh, cobe uh, how much costs a cobe? Uh, this instrument, how um, much money was spent to build it? That's a uh, interesting question. I think at the time that it was built, it cost about 300 million U.S. dollars. Um, in uh, modern money, that would be more money because of inflation of currency. But it, uh, another way of saying it is it took uh, uh, about 1,500 people uh, operating for several years to do it.
So it's much smaller than the James Webb Space Telescope, which uh, has uh, much more budget and uh, takes much longer and is much more powerful. So both uh, telescopes uh, are made of gold, you could say. Okay, okay other question. Uh, expensive than gold. Uh, medical a doctor asks, do you believe that there are a lot of universes and there were many big bangs? Or all the time and matter started with our Big Bang? It's possible that there are other universes, but that we will never be able to prove it. Uh, only mathematicians can speculate about this for us. What a pity that we can't prove it. I would like to know such a interesting information. So, do you have any other questions from the audience, please? My name is Olga Kolesnichenko. My question is about other physics. Uh, many scientists say uh, that uh, the universe is full is um, uh, full of secrets, and maybe there are other laws of physics. Uh, do you believe in such a um, that, that this can really be so? Well, it certainly is true that uh, we do not know all of the laws of science uh, or of physics. Uh, so far, uh, what seems to be true is that each new discovery is a small or uh, modification of the old ones. But I already told you uh, some great mysteries that we have. So we do not know what is dark matter. We do not know what is dark energy. Uh, we do not know um, what is the nature of quantum gravity. Uh, we do not know whether string theory is correct theory. Um, so uh, there are huge mysteries still open in the physical sciences. And of course, uh, biological sciences are making discoveries at an immense uh, pace these days. Uh, so um, we do not know what we'll be discovering, but I think it will be fascinating. And we have many centuries of scientific discovery uh, in front of us, maybe millions of years. Thank you. John, I congratulate you. Uh, your uh, great interest, uh, many women want to ask you, uh, well, the, the question is, are you married? Who is your wife? Is she also a uh, physicist? Uh, and, uh, well, general information about your beautiful wife. To say that I am married. Um, and my wife is a ballet instructor. She teaches classical ballet um, to adults and uh, has been doing that most of her life. And so she is beautiful and talented herself. Um, and she is not a scientist. But it's a good partnership. Now I understand. I know why are you in such a beautiful form. Your wife looks after you. So there is another group um, of questions. I'm trying to formulate it. Um, do uh, astronomers believe in God? Very short and uh, simple question. Do astronomers believe in God? Uh, I think the short answer is yes, some do and some do not. Uh, but, of course, the astronomers that uh, believe in God will probably believe in a different form of God from the ones that uh, have been described uh, in, for many thousands of years in our traditions. Uh, so uh, we picture a God as a, uh, a being floating in a cloud in the sky, and so I don't think astronomers will see that kind of God. We will have a different kind of God. Mm -hmm. 
Thank you. There is another group of questions. I'd like also to unite them into one. Actually, uh, there are three of them. Artyom is asking you what there was before Big Bang. Olga from Novosibirsk asks, why did Big Bang happen? And and at last, Alexey Alexandrov asks, when will we have the next Big Bang? So what could you answer to these questions? We do not know. Um, the uh, next Big Bang may be happening right now somewhere in some other universe that we cannot see. Um, but our own universe, we think, will continue to expand for many billions of years uh, before it might possibly turn around and, and collapse. So uh, it's not soon for us. But uh, because we cannot see if there are other universes, uh, we cannot tell uh, about whether they are also expanding. So I'm sorry I can't answer that question. Mm -hmm. Here I have an invitation. They want to invite you to the Ural region to treat you to dumplings, famous Ural dumplings. And Victoria is also interested. Have you ever visited Russia? Da? I have visited Russia with my wife uh, as a tourist many years ago. I think it was around uh, 1986 or 7. Uh, I don't know, remember the exact year, but it was the year that uh, Ronald Reagan visited Moscow. So we saw many beautiful things in, in Russia then. All, all the way from Sochi to, uh, to uh, Leningrad. There are not only questions coming to us, but also thanks. Thank you for your lecture. We're very grateful to you. It's so interesting. But there are also questions uh, that lie um, beyond science. Stanislav, a teacher of uh, information technologies, he asks, What is the uh, the dark energy in the universe? Uh, could it be the last haven for uh, dead souls? We uh, astro astronomers cannot possibly answer that question. Um, I think we need to consult our, uh, our religious leaders. But I think they will not know either. Thank you. Sergey is asking you how far away uh, can uh, modern uh, telescopes see and how when we uh, have uh, the great super telescope launched, how uh, farther can we see? that we can see is approximately 10 or 11 billion light years, which gets us within a very short time from the beginning. We can see with those telescopes within about 800 million years after the explosion, after the Great Big Bang. The new telescope we hope to be able to see within 200 million years of the Great Explosion, so much closer. Uh, in f terms of physical distance, we do not see very much farther, but we see much closer to the Big Bang itself. Спасибо. Еще вопрос, Александра. Sorry, another question, Alexandra. Thank you very much for your lecture. You said that uh, very many information confirms the theory of the Great Bang. But is it possible that this theory is uh, false? Uh, there, are, uh, uh, there were occasions when theories proven sometimes uh, proved to be wrong. Uh, so could there be uh, that the, there was no Big Bang or something like this? 
so could it be there was no Big Bang? Um, yes, um, there are many things that might have been a little different and surprising. Um, the uh, the idea of the Big Bang is hard to escape since uh, Edwin Hubble showed us his uh, picture in 1929. It's been clear that something very exotic and strange occurred uh, to make the galaxies appear to fly apart. Uh, but the details of what that event was uh, are still open to discussion. Uh, it has to be a lot like the Big Bang, but it doesn't have to be exactly the same. So, for instance, um, when we uh, finally discover a better story about quantum gravity or string theory, uh, maybe uh, we will, or maybe we will discover that Einstein's theory of relativity is not quite correct. Uh, then we'll have a new story for you. Uh, I think it will resemble the Big Bang, but it will, might be different in some details. Uh, that's my guess. Uh, but as you know, uh, I, uh, uh, we do not actually observe the Big Bang directly. We have uh, many ob observations that we must interpret. So uh, it's always possible uh, that uh, we will be surprised. Дорогие друзья в зале, есть ли вопросы, Илья? I would like to put a rather private question. At the site Archifork, there was a published uh, work that they dark called particle, uh, which uh, you used in your noble work, and uh, uh, but that was just a malfunction of uh, some sort, and uh, it was a mistake uh, in uh, uh, well, some sort of a mistake. Could that be possible in a way? The material that you're describing, um, but of course, uh, many astronomers worked with us to try to make sure that there were no mistakes. Um, so, of course, we don't think there was a mistake, uh, but um, one uh, um, could never be completely sure. But our observations have been confirmed by other astronomers. Uh, new telescopes have been flown. Uh, the uh, microwave uh, spots that we saw have been observed again uh, by many astronomers uh, with the equipment on the ground and in space. So uh, we're pretty sure that that's a correct measurement. Uh, similarly, the uh, spectrum that I showed uh, was also observed by another experiment. So, um, although mistakes are possible, uh, we don't think they were very large. So, I think the basic answer is still correct. Спасибо. Да, вопрос, пожалуйста. Наверное, имеет смысл представить. Hello, John. My name is Allah. I'm interested in a question. I know that the moon leaves leaves uh, the Earth uh, with the velocity of three uh, centimeters uh, per year. What will happen when uh, moon will lose connection with Earth? Okay, so when the moon loses connection with the Earth, well, it will be very far in the future. Uh, so um, I don't know whether the calculation says that it will uh, stay with us for a long time. If you multiply three centimeters per year by, uh, say, five billion years, um, that's a lot of meters. So it will get farther away. Um, eventually, um, the, uh, the moon could escape. Now, uh, I don't know whether it will happen before the sun expands and swallows up the Earth. But if the moon escapes before the, um, before the sun uh, swallows us up, then uh, we would, of course, lose the tides that uh, the Earth, that the moon produces. So the, uh, um, the ocean would stop going up and down as it does uh, nearly as much. We still have tides from the sun. Um, and on the other major effect that the, uh, that the moon has on the Earth is to uh, make the spin axis of the Earth uh, change with time. So because of that, uh, that would also change. So uh, I'm not sure. I don't really know. Uh, that's a good question. We should find out. So 
so NASA should <laughs> go into this question. Although there is a question, Evgeny Sidorov from Riga, Latvia, says we have a beautiful, a beautiful um, pictures from Hubble. But why don't uh, we have good uh, good pictures of uh, moon surface and the surfaces of other planets in solar system? Why uh, do you prefer to make uh, pictures of uh, faraway objects and not the, the objects that are very close and interesting to us? Well, actually, um, we, um, Evgenia, we do uh, uh, take pictures of the uh, objects that are close by and interesting, uh, but it's easiest and best to uh, actually send a space mission to there to get the pictures. So we have sent already uh, space missions to Mercury, Venus, Mars, Jupiter, Saturn, uh, Uranus, Neptune, and Pluto, um, as well as to uh, some asteroids and comets. So... Um, uh, it's much better to get a picture close up than it is to take a picture from far away with a big telescope. So uh, uh, the pictures are available, uh, and you can find them uh, quite easily on the Internet. Okay, are there any other questions? Please. Hello, John. I'm a teacher of physics. Unfortunately, the course uh, on uh, an astronomy course was uh, deleted from our school program. Uh, what happens in the United States, and what's your uh, personal opinion? Do we have to have a separate uh, course of astronomy in uh, schools, or it should be integrated with physics? Astronomy is one of the most popular science courses. Uh, it's uh, attractive for students. Uh, it uh, talks about our own history. Uh, and uh, students can see uh, the subject uh, with their own, own eyes at night. Uh, so I think uh, astronomy is one of the most interesting subjects for students, and I hope that we can continue to teach it uh, everywhere. Um, and so um, uh, it's one of the things that helps uh, students get interested in science to begin with, and uh, from there go on into the more difficult areas of other kinds of uh, physics and chemistry and biology. Um, so I think it's very important for us to continue to offer it to the schools. Okay, there is another personal question for you. Sergei Chernov from Kursk. Do you... Uh, the series... Uh, on NBC, the Big Bang Theory. And have you seen at least one series, one uh, episode? Yeah, series, uh, but it is said that it is very funny, and uh, I have heard that the scientific uh, discussions are correct. So um, I don't know. Uh, I haven't seen it personally, but it's supposed to be a lot of fun. I thought you are the expert with this uh, series. Oh, there is another big, big uh, group of questions about catastrophes. Everybody are interested about the end of the world in, in 212. There will be a great uh, explosion and the end of the world as we know it. A lot of people ask, do you believe that uh, 2012 is the last year of the um, Earth. So what do astronomers say? I believe any of those stories. Um, there is, I believe there's uh, some story that the uh, ancient calendar from the um, uh, Mayan inhabitants, uh, inhabitants of Central America uh, will not have enough digits to represent the next year. Uh, in 2012, but um, I think that uh, if they were alive today, they would just add another digit. So I don't think there's a problem with the calendar. I'm not buying any insurance about that. 
Хорошо, спасибо. Окей, thank you. Мурат Мусаев from Баку. What do you think? How long can our civilization last? And uh, when will uh, mankind uh, be able to go to other galaxies? In how many ages? How, how long will our civilization last? Uh, um, well, I do not know, uh, but we certainly can see that everything changes very quickly these days. Uh, that much more quickly than any time in history. So um, uh, I can't really predict when we can go to another galaxy. Uh, right now there's no uh, uh, scientific uh, knowledge that tells us how to go to another galaxy. Um, at the moment it is even too difficult to go to the nearest star, which is much closer. Even just to get to Mars, which is very close, is too difficult for us today. So we do not know how, uh, and we may never be able to do it. Uh, so I'm sorry, it's too difficult, I think. Okay. There is a very simple question for you, Tatiana, astronomer from Irkutsk. Uh, do you uh, have any is uh, with uh, Russian astronomers and astrophysicists. And do you uh, feel difference between astronomers and uh, astrophysicists? And uh, who do you think you are, astronomer or astrophysicist? Uh, okay. Um, yes, I have I have occasional contacts with my uh, Russian colleagues. Uh, um, Rashid Sunyaev is the one that I see most often because he travels occasionally here. Um, the, uh, uh, the difference between astronomers and astrophysicists is not very large. Uh, the astrophysicist attempts to understand the details of, uh, of the physics behind the observations. Um, the astronomer uh, takes the observations and interprets them as well. So I don't think there's much difference. And I think of myself as an astrophysicist because my original degree is in physics, but uh, there's not a very large difference. Hello, my name is Anna. A question concerning dark matter. The you said that the new telescope can give you information, but right now we know very little about it. But do we know something or nothing at all? And if uh, we know something, <laughs> maybe you could uh, say <laughs> what? <laughs> okay, well, the dark matter is, uh, is uh, recognized by its gravitational force. Uh, so uh, the way that we study it is to find uh, galaxies and clusters of galaxies uh, where there's enough uh, dark matter to bend light or to affect the orbits of, uh, of the stars. Uh, so uh, it's been known for, uh, for many, many years that the uh, galaxies do not spin the way that they should spin if the only matter there is made of stars and gaseous material. So uh, for maybe 50 years we have known there's a problem with uh, dark matter, but we did not know what it is. And so uh, astronomers can tell you much more about where the dark matter is and uh, maybe eventually how it got that way. Um, to really learn about the dark matter, we need to have a particle made in the laboratory, say at the Large Hadron Collider in Europe, or at, uh, maybe even in a laboratory where a natural dark matter particle might collide with our detector. And then we could learn a lot more about dark matter. Uh, right now, it's a very, com very large mystery, and uh, I don't think it's going to be an easy problem. Вопрос? That's Ale once again. I would like to 
put a paradoxical question. Tell me, how could it be in a country that is uh, always has uh, uh, leading positions in astronomy and is very popular, a lot of people uh, believe into astrology and, and horoscopes. How can these two matters live in one country? A lot of uh, people who like astronomy and a lot of people who like astro astrology. Well, uh, I think your question is a question for people in a different area of science, uh, psychology and sociology, um, but it's a puzzle to me as well. I'm surprised. I thought uh, personally after uh, many centuries of uh, educational progress that more people would understand astronomy, um, but um, they don't. No, we seem to but do you read the horoscopes yourself? John, do you use uh, horoscopes in your life uh, from time to time? Say for me and tell me, and we all what, laugh about them. What, 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 John, начните с себя и с тех, кто рядом. John, what vapros So you have to start with you and you do those who are uh, uh, near you to educate. Uh, sorry, there is another question. What is the most important what is the most most important question about the universe that you hope to get information on with the new telescope? Most important questions is the formation of the first stars and galaxies. It uh, could possibly produce a great surprise for us. Um, it is uh, suggested, for instance, that uh, perhaps the first stars were not made out of the ordinary matter that we see today, but were actually um, formed by dark matter, and that they may have uh, uh, burned dark matter uh, in their uh, in their centers. So uh, this is one of the more um, surprising possibilities, and I think it would be very exciting if we could learn whether this is true or not. Um, the other thing that I think could be wonderfully surprising would be to uh, detect uh, evidence of life on another planet. And so I don't know whether the James Webb Telescope can do that. Uh, probably not, but some uh, future telescope not too far in the future possibly will tell us about planets that are alive elsewhere in the universe. I think that would be a very important thing for science and for culture. Okay, students from St. Petersburg is interested. What will you be doing after the telescope it will be launched? What's your uh, next uh, goal in life. Maybe they are looking for the goals in their own life and just uh, want some advice from you. Next challenge will be to use the telescope uh, to decide uh, what I think is the most important scientific project and to try to uh, obtain the observations that would uh, help uh, make a, an advance in that area. Um, but also, maybe I will start work on the next telescope that follows this one. Uh, I do not know what will happen in five years. But still, John, your new telescope uh, doesn't um, look like a telescope. It's like a board with a uh, sail. Do you have a designer of your telescopes who invented this strange uh, construction and contraption? Uh, it's really very <laughs> untelescopic looking like. <laughs> Doesn't look like a telescope. I understand. Um, it was, of course, uh, partly my idea and partly the idea of many other people. Um, but it is uh, required uh, to do two things. One is to make the telescope cold 
so that it uh, is protected from the sun and the earth. Now the Hubble Space Telescope uh, looks more like a telescope. It's a tube uh, and it's orbiting around the earth, uh, but it is kept warm by the heat of the earth and the heat of the sun. Uh, for us to make a telescope that is cold, it must have a special shade uh, that protects it from the sun, uh, and the other side must be open to outer space uh, so the heat can, can escape. So that's why the telescope looks uh, as strange as it does. Uh, the other part of it is that because the telescope must be larger than the rocket that carries it into space, it must be folded up. And so that makes it look even more strange. Um, so uh, uh, it's because of the special requirements that we have. But of course, it's a beautiful sight when in what in starts to uh, uh, reveal itself. There's a question. I don't know from whom. Except uh, your projects in NASA, what are your personal interest in astrophysics? I think are uh, very closely connected with my, my work for NASA. Uh, I think I described already that I'm interested in the first stars that formed after the Big Bang uh, and in the uh, process for formation of planets and uh, possibilities for life. Uh, but currently, most of my work is uh, connected with engineering to make sure that this wonderful new telescope will, will function correctly when it is launched. So I work with scientists and engineers to make that, uh, make that true. Thank you. Let's speak about feelings at last. Pavel Sorokin is wondering. Much esteemed Professor Mother, what were your feelings when you were given the Nobel Prize? Well, um, uh, I had many feelings, of course, uh, when I received the prize. The, uh, the, uh, one, one feeling is that uh, I'm amazed myself to be on the same list of people as Albert Einstein and the great scientists of, of the past. So um, another part is that I know that the work that I did was uh, uh, part of a very large team, and so I always wanted to make sure that people could see that it was a team project in modern times that uh, is required to do uh, one of these new discoveries. Uh, not all of uh, science is done in large teams, but at least uh, in astronomy, uh, it takes a very large team to build a new telescope or to build a new observatory of some sort. Uh, on the other hand, uh, you see in biology and uh, sometimes in astronomy that uh, a very small team of people uh, still can make a great discovery. Um, also, it was wonderful just to be celebrating, uh, to, uh, to meet uh, famous people uh, besides myself and to, uh, to get acquainted, uh, to meet the King of Sweden, um, to meet uh, the Prime Minister, uh, and, uh, and to have uh, a banquet in the Great Hall with uh, a thousand uh, people is a totally uh, overwhelming event. So we congratulate you once again. But tell me, John, you agree that there are a lot of Americans among Nobel Prize winners. Is it uh, is it a normal situation, or is? But be sincere, please. Not politically correct. <laughs> that many Americans have won the prize, uh, uh, but I think it's somewhat of an accident of history that there was a period of time uh, when the United States had uh, very generous support for science and uh, many other countries could not do that. Uh, now I think the world is changing rapidly. Uh, other countries are becoming much more prosperous and uh, producing uh, very many brilliant uh, scientists and engineers. Uh, and uh, America now worries that it will no longer be the leader that it has been for so long. So uh, we have reports uh, uh, for our Congress uh, very frequently uh, complaining that we do not educate our students well. So uh, I think uh, you may see in the future that uh, many more prizes are going to other countries. Oh, John, I just recommend 
John, I do recommend you. As a Nobel Prize winner, you have the right to recommend a new scientist. So start recommending Russian scientists. It would be logical and uh, adjustable. Oh, there is another question for you. Hello, John. My name is Valentina. Uh, tell me, do you believe in uh, Nostradamus predictions? Um, do I believe in Nostradamus predictions? Well, I don't actually know what they are, so I don't know. Uh, but uh, probably not. Не знаком? Отлично. Не знаком. Мы тоже не знакомы. Вот вопрос еще, пожалуйста. Another question, please. Marina. There is a young man in the end of the hall. Hello, my name is Alexei. I would like to put a cosmic question. What's the difference? Uh, what is the difference between dark energy and dark matter? Energy is the name that we give to the, uh, the, uh, the force that we imagine causes the universe to accelerate, uh, to expand more rapidly every year. Uh, the dark matter is the name we give to uh, what we think are small particles. Uh, that uh, are like ordinary matter particles, but do not interact with uh, with light waves. So uh, they have gravity, uh, but not uh, uh, they don't cause the universe to accelerate. Now, uh, are these really true things? Uh, since uh, uh, we cannot make any of them in the laboratory, it's very hard to know for sure. So in uh, in the future, it may become uh, that we believe that um, dark energy is actually just a different uh, way of gravity, that uh, maybe Einstein's theory of gravity is incomplete, uh, or that uh, quantum gravity has a new prediction for us. Um, similarly, uh, dark uh, matter may come uh, as a result of uh, some experiments in the laboratory, and maybe we will now understand them uh, in the next 10 or 20 years. But I do not, do not know. I'm sorry, we can't really be sure. Uh, are you uh, are you sure about the big Andron collider? Aren't you afraid uh, that the new uh, Big Bang may be in some way connected with the work of the collider? We are speaking about LHC. Collider uh, that uh, a new Big Bang could occur, uh, but uh, we think it's very unlikely because nature already produces very high energy particles in space. You know, uh, cosmic rays uh, come to us with uh, much energies that are much, much, much higher than any that are produced in the Hadron Collider. So nature has already done the experiment. And if there were going to be a new Big Bang produced by those kinds of interactions, it would have already occurred. Uh, so uh, we don't think it's very dangerous. John, do you understand what the problem is? The problem is that the society needs some answers. Do you agree with that? The problem is that the society needs uh, some answers. And when there is a number of physicists, that there is uh, an a very small but still a possibility uh, that the collider can uh, be a danger. So people will be afraid, of course. Can you tell us uh, quite uh, um, well to be sure, can you say there is actually no danger in the collider work? Uh, in my opinion, there is no danger in the collider work. Uh, if there were danger, the universe would already be over, because nature already produces uh, these kinds of collisions uh, by natural processes, and nothing bad has happened. All right. No danger? Good. Questions, please. Vladimir Surdin, Moscow University. 
Do you see a uh, possibility? Do you see a possibility to uh, look into the history of the universe deeper than uh, to the point from which we uh, get the um, uh, get the signals the uh, from which we get the uh, I forgot the word <laughs> well you know what I'm speaking about you know that the uh, microwave heat radiation from the Big Bang has many properties uh, one of them is polarization uh, you know if you wear uh, polarized sunglasses and you turn your head the sky can be uh, brighter or darker um, and so we can measure the polarization properties of the cosmic microwave radiation from the Big Bang. Uh, and it is predicted that those polarization properties uh, may arise from gravitational waves in the primordial material. So in the first sub-microseconds after the Big Bang, uh, these, produces, these conditions would be produced. Uh, and if we can measure this polarization, maybe we will then understand something much closer to the Big Bang itself possible. And astronomers are working on it now. Thank you. I was waiting for this, and this happened in Internet about the UFO. A question about UFO. Did astronomers Uh, happened to notice UFOs with very strange characteristics that cannot be explained in the ordinary way of things. Wonderful things in the sky, they're very far away. Um, and um, I think our biggest surprise uh, for astronomers in the last few years was about gamma ray bursts. You know, uh, uh, for about 40 years, we knew that there were stars or something exploding and producing immense amounts of gamma radiation. Um, and now we know that these are happening at the edge of the universe. Uh, they are stars that explode, uh, and they aim their little jets of material at us. So that's the biggest surprise to me uh, from astronomy. Now, uh, do we see, as astronomers, any uh, flying objects here in the Earth's atmosphere? Uh, no, uh, they don't come to visit me. I'm very sorry they have not visited me. I have not seen them. Uh, and I don't know of any astronomers who have seen them. Ну вообще, в среднем количество американцев, которые... But the average number of Americans that have seen UFOs is much uh, bigger than in any other country. Maybe it's just fantasies. There is another question. Do you, what, sorry, what will give more, what will be more positive for science, your telescope or the uh, large uh, hadronic collider? What will be more beneficial? that we see is that uh, no uh, dramatic changes have occurred uh, for uh, science in this country as yet. Uh, the, uh, there are small changes that are occurring, and I think things are going in a better direction. Uh, but of course, uh, there cannot be a rain of gold. Uh, the money must come from somewhere. So uh, the f government uh, receives taxes from the taxpayers, and so it's all up to them uh, what they will do. Uh, right now, uh, everybody is very concerned about the economic crisis, but I think the president is correct that uh, uh, for the long term, we must have educated people. Otherwise, we will uh, not uh, maintain our position as a prosperous country. Um, so uh, I think the president is very correct to focus on education as a very important part of our future, and I think it's obviously true for all nations. So I would like to thank Michael and Yuba especially for uh, uh, arranging all of these events, and I very much enjoyed uh, speaking with you. Um, and so uh, if we have time for just one more question, that would be fine. But uh, anyway, I wanted to make sure to thank you for arranging this. This has been very interesting for me. Thank you. John, we would like to thank you. 
Thank you, John. But we want to thank you for your lecture, for you spending so much time with us. You answered all our questions, uh, some foolish. You were very patient, and you had to wait an hour because you didn't change time <laughs> in <laughs> United States uh, as they did all over the world, so we didn't know about it, <laughs> really. Uh, so thank you very much for all of it. Information about this event, your answers will be published in internet in two days, actually. But we'll keep in contact. Thank you very much once again. Удачи вам, мистер Кинский. Это значит случай. Все расходятся. Ждет вопрос. Или хочет что? Вы сказали, Very rarely watch TV. Но она очень полезна для здоровья. Лучше вап... Так, друзья, вопросы. Okay, questions. We have two questions. Unfortunately, we have no time in, on the air. Dear Professor Mazur, do you know Russian scientist Tsiolkovsky, Konstantin Tsiolkovsky? Did you hear something about the Tsiolkovsky readings that take place every year in Kaluga? Uh, you spoke about uh, global warming. Do you see uh, uh, that global warming, warming could come from uh, some cosmic reasons? Questions there. Uh, I am not aware of uh, Dr. Salkowski. Um, but uh, it sounds like his work may be very interesting. Uh, the uh, possibility of cosmic causes for global uh, climate change are, certainly exists. Uh, we have, of course, uh, only begun to understand the causes of the ice ages and other very large climate changes here on Earth. Um, so uh, there's a, a lot that we do not know. Uh, we are constantly being surprised by the new scientific results in uh, climate change now also um, was only quite recently recognized that it is occurring. By the way, it was predicted uh, by Arrhenius uh, in, uh, I think, about 1895, when he uh, was studying the effects of carbon dioxide on the atmosphere. Um, and uh, people did not believe him at the time. Uh, but now it's quite well recognized that carbon dioxide and other molecules really do uh, make the Earth get warmer. Now, uh, and, and he knew in 1895 that uh, the u use of uh, fossil fuel would cause a climate change, uh, but it was hard to prove. Uh, now we know from observations that uh, things are changing very quickly uh, and that it's pretty clear um, that uh, scientists agree that it's happening mostly because of human activity. But there are certainly are chances for cosmic uh, climate causes as well. Uh, just today I was reading a, a, a scientific paper about uh, whether um, uh, passages through different parts of the galaxy could cause uh, climate change here on Earth. The uh, answer that they got was no, it's not possible. Uh, but it's certainly an interesting scientific question. Uh, our uh, cosmic environment does change as the sun orbits through the galaxy. And now the last question, and then I'll... Okay. I would like uh, to ask uh, you a question about Kyoto Protocol. Americans do not sign it. Uh, do you agree with the American policy not signing this protocol? 
Uh, I'm not an expert on this subject, uh, so I don't have a, a, a careful understanding of it. Um, but it looks to me like uh, Americans now understand much better than they did before that uh, climate change is important and that uh, a world uh, response to climate change must be uh, developed. So something that requires the cooperation of all nations is, is necessary. So I certainly hope that we will achieve that. Thank you. Friends, unfortunately, we have two minutes. And I would like to put the last question about organization of science. In spring, your president gave a very colorful speech about uh, science and education. And uh, your president promised uh, to uh, give bigger financing to science and education, even in the midst of financial crisis. Did you feel any change in the political course of your government? Did you get more financing? Did you have this rain of gold that uh, <laughs> you feel in your laboratory? For no truth. Great the pieces of equipment. Uh, I think they work on very different subjects. Uh, both of them are addressing uh, questions of great importance to science, uh, and uh, we certainly hope that they both work beautifully. Wish us all luck. Very correct. Hello, John. Thank you for your lecture. My name is Rosa. I have a question for you. What science, uh, what are the most um, interesting uh, uh, so, um, discoveries in science, not in physicists, not in physics, uh, that are most important for mankind for the last two years, I think. A very large question. I think uh, the, um, the parts that intrigue me the most are in biology and in the history of mankind. So um, uh, there are many discoveries about. Uh, how human beings uh, came to live here on Earth, and uh, and the uh, and the history of our ancestors in Africa, uh, the uh, ability we now have to do genetic uh, analysis and find out uh, where our ancestors have traveled. I have sent my uh, DNA off to be analyzed, uh, and so I now have a uh, map from the National Geographic in the United States that says uh, uh, my Y chromosome came by way of. Uh, uh, Kazakhstan to the United States, so uh, and so did uh, most Europeans, I think. So uh, this is uh, perhaps nice, not nice important, trick, but nice. it is of great interest. Uh, they, um, uh, but it seems to me the most rapid progress and the uh, things of most uh, great uh, personal importance to people are all coming from biology these days. Uh, in the, in terms of scientific discoveries. For engineering, uh, we certainly now also have many wonderful challenges about uh, the future energy supply and uh, climate uh, change of this world. Uh, but those are not just science projects. Those are also very large engineering projects and, uh, and social projects. I don't think I answered your question. I have an adjacent question. What do you what do you don't know about yourself and would like to learn with uh, achievements in, in genetics and biology? What would you like to know about yourself? To know about myself. Well, um, I certainly would like to know more about my family history and how uh, people migrated around the world. I think that's 
it's uh, it's fun to think about that. It's not actually important, but it's interesting. Um, so uh, it seems to be very popular to uh, to trace one's uh, family history uh, as far back as possible. So, uh, for instance, uh, my uh, my ancestor uh, was an unmarried woman in England, uh, maybe several hundred years ago. Um, it would be nice to know uh, something about the uh, the rest of the family and how did that happen. So, it's uh, not not important, but interesting. Спасибо. Вопросы из интернета. Анна интересуется. Анна спрашивает, Джон, какую литературу вы... Анна, through internet, asks you, what literature do you uh, read in your free time, if you have any? What genres, what authors are your favorite? like are uh, tend to be uh, non-fiction authors uh, writing about uh, world politics and uh, and uh, climate change and uh, things of that sort uh, mostly i read news material uh, the economist magazine i subscribe to and many other news magazines uh, and uh, of course professional scientific magazines uh, that i get uh, every week john are we television smart that I do not read uh, fiction material more. Thank you, Michael. It would be a great pleasure when I get to do that in person. Bye-bye. <laughs> okay. Thank you. And thank your team, KTs and Eileen, which I uh, have had a uh, big, uh, big letter history. <laughs> yes, thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Bye-bye.